Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to a lecture 11b. And in this particular lecture, we are going to be looking at multi-unit buildings in wood frame construction. Uh, so we've discussed uh, new residential buildings, single detached in this course on residential technology, and we've looked at renovations uh, using wood frame technology. Uh, so now we'll take a look at multi-unit um, buildings and look at some of the, the different things that we need to consider um, with regard to things such as sound transmission and fire resistance. Uh, so this image here is a, a row of uh, townhouses that are actually in the shipyards in Collingwood. And so this is a unit here and you can kind of see the fire um, separation here. So we have a fire resistant wall that's going in here to separate out the different um, units. And so one of the things we have to think about with fire resistance uh, is that we don't have a wall uh, without a fire. And you can see here too, probably even better in the distance. Um, if a fire starts in one unit, it shouldn't go across to the next unit very quickly. So a fire resistant wall um, the purpose of it is to slow the spread of fire uh, long enough that the fire department can come and contain it to that one unit. Uh, in the past, uh, in the distance pa distant past, uh, if a fire started in one and you didn't have this fire separation here, or say there was a faulty wiring up in uh, where the ceiling joists are and a fire started in the attic, it would just spread right through from unit to unit to unit and in no time uh, you would have the whole um, structure ablaze. Um, it's almost like the spread of uh, COVID during a pandemic, if you want to think of it that way. I guess we all think about these things these days. Um, so uh, this would contain it uh, to this uh, particular area long enough um, to prevent the spread. So this is what we have to think about when we think about uh, multi-unit buildings and structures and how we are going to um, do that and the building code requirements um, for that. Uh, so those are some major uh, considerations is fire separation, noise uh, reduction, and also constructability. How can we put this up pretty fast and pretty uh, quickly and cost effectively? Uh, usually the reason townhomes are going in or multi-unit structures, the um, Zoning is requiring increased density, highest and best use by the builder says I can get more of return from this property if I have more units and I can properly design and um, make them attractive enough that people want to buy them. So these are some uh, considerations that come in. And of course, if I can do this faster, we've talked about building information modeling, we've talked about prefabrication, if there's things that we can do um, off-site and bring them to site and drop them on the roof and that sort of thing and have panels that we put together and assemble on site that can save us a lot of time too. Um, so it's most municipalities that uh, like in urban settings are looking to increase density not to reduce density. It's much more cost effective for them too from a taxation purpose and from a management of infrastructure purpose to have things less spread out and more concentrated. It may not be the best, you know, you can, we can argue the, and debate the social aspects and family life and that sort of stuff, but there's also costs that come into play. So, and there's the sustainability and environmental aspects. And it's considered that if you have intensification, uh, that's much better on the environment as a whole, as opposed to spreading out over miles and miles of farmland um, with one acre uh, residential lots, right? Uh, so uh, particularly true in Canada in these jurisdictions and pick any um, major uh, cities uh, that you want in the US, same idea globally. It's, it's things don't change that much from that perspective. Uh, so um, the, and also things such as I, I didn't mention transit and all of those requirements, you know, if you're going to put in uh, light rail transit systems, uh, subway systems, rail systems, uh, buses. It's a lot easier if it's a smaller grid than a, a more spread out grid. And multi-units uh, can uh, be uh, 
constructed using um, multiple, like a typical condominium sort of design. They don't have to be this townhouse. Townhouse increases density, but then you can have um, low rise condominiums. And uh, up till relatively recently, you could only go four stories uh, with a wood frame construction. Uh, now you can go six stories uh, with wood frame, uh, but you can also go uh, in certain cases even more than six stories uh, using other um, wood lumber products uh, such as uh, CLTs, cross laminated timbers. A good example of that is a building called the Arbor at George Brown College, which is going to start construction very, very soon. Uh, and it's going to be a multiple story. I think they've got it originally was 12 story. I think the new design is at 10 stories. Uh, you might have to verify that, but 10 stories and it's made out of wood. Uh, there is one in uh, London, England that is 18 stories um, tall and it's cross laminated timbers. Uh, Seattle, Washington, very good place to visit and see a lot of multiple story wood frame constructed uh, buildings that they did with wood frame, uh, uh, six stories, uh, but they also are kind of leading in uh, CLTs, cross laminated timbers and timber and British Columbia, another area. Well, they've got a great natural resource there. So they, they've they always tended to be a little bit uh, ahead of some of the other states and provinces that way because of the great natural resources that they have. Likely why Seattle, same, same deal, um, has that. Uh, there's actually a really interesting YouTube video. Uh, if um, you Google, I'm sure you'd find it, but it, the earthquake testing on wood frame uh, multi-story buildings. They built, a, I think it was a six-story model uh, in Seattle, and they put it in, on basically um, a section uh, that would vibrate the building to emulate uh, earthquakes and to a, a various categories. And it was amazing how well the structure resisted earthquakes. And my personal experience uh, with wood frame construction, having visited and presented in uh, Japan uh, on wood frame construction was um, the Kobe earthquake and how resilient uh, wood frame construction is during an earthquake. And then if you're in a seismic area, there's a few design things that you change and there's few absorbers that you can put in the wall to actually um, allow the building to move and to flex uh, without uh, structurally compromising it. And so it's a very resilient system and huge advantage to this kind of structure in seismic areas is that after an event, uh, it's much easier to do the repairs and there's higher confidence levels in these structures being able to um, survive multiple events. Whereas with reinforced concrete, it's, it's more questionable. It can definitely survive the event, but just finding the problems, repairing the problems is a lot more extensive to prevent it from, to make sure that it can survive follow-up events, right? So um, that is one of the reasons why this is very, very popular on the West Coast. And it's becoming more popular in places like Toronto and Ontario. And I think it's gonna have its niche, all right? Uh, in mid-rise, uh, because you can prefabricate a lot of it. So you get your act to gear, you prefabricate a lot of it. That means you can assemble it really, really quickly like the one group that presented on that um, building that was being built and it was prefab and how much was done in a very short period of time was um, quite, quite telling of how you can move things along. And so you could imagine if you build the systems and structures that these could go up pretty rapidly because while you're putting in the foundations, then this is happening in the background being prefabricated. And so by the time you're out of the ground, you're getting them delivered and then you're going to be up to the top floor in a very short period of time. Drastic time savers. That is big in construction. A change in methodology that allows that is a very positive thing. Now, on the other side of it, to play both sides of it fairly um, evenly here, it's quite vulnerable during construction. 
CLT is less so uh, across laminated timbers because it's like, big, you could imagine big logs. They don't always start, a fire doesn't start so easy on a big log. You ever started fires, it's, you got to have kindling, you got to get it going. But smaller stuff like this uh, with uh, wood frame and stick, uh, it's very vulnerable during the frame and rough in stages. It's fine once you get the um, fire resistant surfaces on it, like the fire resistant drywall on it, uh, then it's fine. And once you have the outside protected as well, it's fine because it's, it'll take a long time for a fire to break through and to start. And if something does start, they can get to it. Uh, but uh, during construction, that's the that's sort of the weak point because you know you have if you have a six story wood frame stick building, you better have some good security on site there. Somebody smokes where they shouldn't have, and so on and so forth. A welder's torch, etc. Um, these could cause some uh, catastrophic events. So you have to be careful um, during those uh, times, especially if it's hot and dry and um, that that kind of uh, environment. So that, that would be a downside, but really only during the construction process. And so if you're prefabricating it, you can get it up and you can get it roughed in and you can get it closed in in a fairly quick time frame. Well, then you've negated some of that issues. And the other problem is actually doing all the fire, um, all the uh, fireproofing and um, making sure that everything has all the proper fire resistant um, requirements it's more it requires more time and effort on that part of it uh, than it does when the whole building is like reinforced concrete right uh, but uh, still cost wise once this gets into a system approach that would be largely mitigated as well because there'd be a lot of benefits cost wise to this structure uh, the other thing is from a sustainability point of view concrete takes a lot of energy to produce so it is not considered the most sustainably friendly material on the planet that way because of the immense amount of energy required to make Portland cement. Now, are they coming up with more effective ways of producing concrete and other alternatives? Yeah, but uh, this is quite uh, from a sustainability point of view. And if it's um, FSC Lumber, uh, Ford Stewardship Council, that it's from um, basically tree farms that are um, managed in a sustainable way, uh, meaning you're not cutting down rainforest and that sort of thing, then that's a, a positive as well. Uh, so there's a, a lot to be thinking about with uh, multi-unit buildings um, that way. So when we say fire separation, um, that's to separate, uh, that's the separation that's used to protect the occupants of adjoining units from the threat of fire. And so that would be in a building like this, this would be the floors and the ceilings and the interior walls and the exterior walls and all of that would be considered part of our fire separations. And so you would have individual units that you would have to make sure um, have proper fire separations that meet all the Ontario Building Code um, require requirements. And when you're in a building that, when you're in a house, if you have, you know, proper smoke alarms, they notify you there's a fire, you can get out of the house. By the time a smoke alarm goes off, you, you typically have plenty of time to get out of the house safely, if it's got all the smoke alarms in the right places as per the building code. Um, you know, at the, each floor level in the bedrooms now with the new code, um, plenty of time to get out. Uh, and doesn't necessarily protect the house. Like if there's a fire, you know, uh, that could still do a lot of damage to the house. But as far as the occupants go, they should be able to get out of the house uh, easier. Uh, if you've got a multi-story building, going back to this one, well, you've got to be more careful, right? Because people have to um, go through mutually shared hallways and they have to go down a number of flights and that's why condominium buildings um, and things of that nature. So they have to be sprinklered the buildings to um, ensure that it, it sl really slows down and manages um, the fire, um, the spread of fire process. So there's a number of uh, requirements that come into play uh, when we're talking about multi-story, multi-unit um, condominium buildings that are wood frame or cross laminated timbers compared to just a single low rise house. Uh, so that's, that's, um, that's why, you know, 
requirements are much more complicated. Uh, the larger the structure, the larger the building, and for its intended occupancy, like for assembly purposes where you've got large amounts of people, there has to be a lot of thought given into that. Otherwise, um, it can lead to quite tragic events. So the wall that separates the units is called the party wall. It's separating the two um, units. And it's the fire separation must be strong enough to withstand the collapse of other members against it. So other things that may fall against it, furniture that's on fire that collapses against the wall and that sort of thing uh, to prevent the walls collapse. So it's gotta be fairly sturdy. And um, there'll be different fire separation time periods based on what I was saying earlier. And I'm not gonna get into the, the nuances of the code because you'll be studying building code in a different course. Uh, but uh, basically, depending on the units and that, it may have a 45-minute rating, it may have a one-hour rating, a two-hour rating, a three-hour rating, um, depending on uh, the design and um, the building code requirements. So fire separation needs to be constructed with non-combustible materials um, assembled to meet the building code fire resistance ratings, and there's a lot of different uh, requirements around that. And so I've got a couple, some TACBOC details that you can sort of look at and get a sense of how do they slow, what do I mean by fire resistance rating and slowing the spread of fire between um, units. And so it says 5 8 type X gypsum board, two by four stud, 24 inches on center. Well, there's two walls. So there's two stud walls here um, from one unit to the next unit uh, and Essentially, that's going to be your fire separation um, between the units. Ideally, the studs shouldn't align with each other. They should be offset for sound transmission purposes. Uh, and the bad insulation is there to stop the convection currents from forming through the wall. Uh, so this little half inch gypsum that they've got in strips here, it's hard to see it that way is um, to hold the, gyp uh, the insulation in place. Um, you can also see very important little details, like if you're gonna have box around here, this is, so this is a horizontal section. So it's like you cut through the wall horizontally, not vertically. Most of the ones we've looked at in this course have been vertical sections, you know, like looking through uh, the house and seeing inside the house vertically. Chapter four, a lot of the details, they were vertical sections. This is a horizontal section. So it's like we've got a bird's eye view and we're looking down. So this is like a duct that would be going vertically in the corner uh, of the, the wall over there, right? And it'd be a box around it. Well, we wanna make sure that behind that, the drywall has been put in and it's been taped. So there's no gaps or holes in it. Um, so that has to run straight through and then this gets boxed in. Not we box this in and drywall around only this, and then this is just, you know, insulation, maybe even nothing there because you box this around, you couldn't access it. So uh, those types of things where you'd have bulkheads and all of those things, the drywall would have to go up and be taped before you would put the bulkhead on the inside of it. Um, so that would be a consideration. This is showing uh, where you have um, vertical section trusses. Uh, so in this case, you've got, it says elevation A here. Okay, so elevation A, that would be looking that direction. So that means the trusses, they're going this way, all right? And so now if I go to elevation A, this is the end view of the roof trusses. So this is the end view of um, the roof trusses. And in between the trusses, because the trusses are actually going through. So they're going through the wall, right? Through from one unit to the other, but you have to put in fire stopping between them, right? So you have basically have to put in a, sorry, a fire uh, resistant wall built in between each truss. That's a pain in the neck. It's much easier when the truss goes parallel with like right in alignment with the party wall, right? So it's right over, it's much easier um, than it is when it goes crossover as far as work 
um, goes. Maybe I'm just going to slide back to that um, earlier slide just to um, take a look because I think um, so in this case, that's where it's it's pretty easy. See, the trusses are going this way. And so it's pretty easy to put the layers of um, fire-resistant drywall and to meet the, um, the fire separation requirements when it's going this way. If the trusses were going the opposite direction, that's where you've got to fill in between each truss. That's a lot more work, which is what this drawing is emulating. I think if I didn't explain that, it would be difficult for you to visualize that. So hopefully you're getting that. Um, so what we're doing, though, is we're stopping it from spreading from one unit to the other. So this is that spread point. Now this is actually, uh, the next slide is showing you at a wall. And so we've got in the foundation, we've got a block wall that's showing separating the two units. And sometimes there'll be a requirement based on how many units you have to where you have to put actually a masonry wall all the way through up. So all the way up the house because it has a longer fire separation rating, uh, higher fire separation rating. So, and longer if you want to look at it that way. So here uh, we've got our block and um, we have here it's shown uh, space between the joists, beams filled solid, uh, staggered uh, minimum four inches, seven and a half solid masonry under beams and two inch solid masonry under the joist. And this is showing sort of that grid pattern to show that that would be filled solid, that block, if it was block, if it's poured concrete, but typically it's block when you do fire separations. Um, could be uh, done with concrete though. Uh, so here we have um, coming up, this is where you see this here. This is how they do the separation between the floors to make sure that the fire doesn't go through from one floor to the next. Um, they've got blocking, but they've got drywall between the floors. Um, and that's to stop the fire from being able to go through and in through the floor levels, right? So there has to, they don't have to put drywall the whole way up. They just have to put it at these points, all right? They have to have the drywall on the inside and on the outside. And then again, you got to look at what, how many units and what the fire separation rating is. But if this is just two units here, you got five eighths type, tech, uh, type X gypsum board, right? Um, which will give the proper fire rating just between these two units. Again, bulkhead, in this case, it's a bulkhead, right? So now it's along the ceiling. You have the drywall goes in first and then it's taped. This is like the one example I just showed you when I went back where the trusses are parallel. And so that's much easier um, to do. And in this case, they want three layers of 5 8 type X gypsum board in the attic to separate that. No fire is flowing from one unit to the other. Um, out tightly fitting electrical outlet boxes to be offset um, so they can't be opposite each other in the wall, you know, so fire doesn't spark and go through. Um, uh, provide uh, acoustical ceiling around the perimeter of the box and at floor and wall junction. So that's um, sort of giving you that. And then it's giving you some different, um, different alternative uh, examples of how that might uh, be framed in different ways. There's a lot of different sort of nuances because you always have these little conditions, you know, where a beam pocket may be coming across and uh, things of uh, that nature. Here we've got again pipe uh, chase. So this would be a pipe chase coming down probably in the corner of the wall. There it is. Um, so uh, in a case like that, the drywall has got to go up and in through and where the joists meet up, even though there's rim joists in here, um, this has to be um, filled in uh, with your drywall blocking in through here. Where it goes through between units where it meets an outside wall. This would be a hatching for a brick veneer. There's your one inch airspace. Drywall has to come right through the outside wall, right through, right through um, the outside wall. And uh, the drywall has to go right behind the um, corner, um, the corner boxes for the ductwork that's sort of piping that's going up in that case. So there it is going right through the wall. Right, right, that's like this example here, very similar, right through the wall. Here it is going across. This is actually where you've got 
a girder truss going through and they've had to fill in between the trusses, right, in the attic. And then you can see how this comes down in between the floors. So it's almost like, I don't know, is there one like that there? It's like this situation going on here. It's just that theirs comes down further. That's what's going on there, right? Here we got it coming through again from the plate from the floor above. So this situation here is very much um, this situation going on again. And that's the 5 8 type X drywall. Nice and easy for an inspector to see that it's not just 5 8 regular drywall. There it is going below. There it is lining up with the truss. You can see the several layers going through there. There's going through to the outside wall. Here it's coming up through the floor. Same idea. Um, so those fire separations, so that the fire wouldn't spread between floor to floor. Um, so you get those kind of um, conditions uh, that, that you need to really sort of build into townhouses and multi-unit uh, structures. I did mention earlier the sort of the cross laminated timbers. If you didn't know what I was talking about with that, they're called CLTs. Probably the best thing to do is um, to look at some YouTube videos on it. You can see they're, they're really kind of a... I don't want to say a new innovation, but um, the idea of building whole wall systems out of them uh, and then having CNC uh, machinery cut out the doors and windows and make it into a very sort of production assembly line kind of process. Uh, I think that's got a lot of opportunities with everything that we've talked about, building information modeling, tying that together with um, the resilience of this product. It's not, and it's not as, uh, the stick methods that I showed with the multi-story is much more vulnerable. This would be less so. It's not so easy to, to sort of um, catch fire as uh, stick-based um, materials. There can be also, it can be treated to um, be more resistant to that during the construction process. It can, be, it can be done that it's actually providing an interior finish to the, the structure. Uh, so there's a lot of um, good opportunities. And as I mentioned, uh, George Brown is building a uh, building called the Arbor. There's actually a very short YouTube video on regarding it um, if you want to check it out. Uh, so yeah, uh, and um, these buildings uh, they they have they're not part of part nine. They part nine's three stories, six hundred square meters or less, not for assembly purposes. These buildings have to be designed and engineered, and um, the buildings need to be uh, sprinklered uh, and there's extensive engineering with regards to fire separations, etc. Uh, so as they're treated like a condominium, a condominium building is a condominium building, right? So that's that comes under that no matter what you're building it with. Uh, so uh, also you have to think about shrinkage. Now these cross laminated timbers, because they are cross laminated, it kind of fights and resists the shrink shrinkage between the different because they're cross oriented. Uh, so um, this, the impacts of shrinkage is largely mitigated, but there still has to be considerations in, in the process. Dimensional lumber, another story hauled together. You're not building a six story wood frame uh, structure with dimensional lumber joists. You are using eye joists. You're not using uh, because of the shrinkage issues, right? Uh, so those, and we talked about shrinkage and how that works, like these multi-units here, um, you're, they're going to be considering um, using uh, eye joists, etc. on the floor systems and the, that because of the shrinkage adds up floor to floor to floor. So um, that has to be all calculated and how it fits from one material to another also has to be calculated in there. Of course, we also have, uh, there are manufactured studs uh, that come like manufactured uh, floor systems that can be utilized that have very little shrinkage as well. So there, are, you know, these things can all be designed and mitigated into the uh, process and allowed for. Sound transmission, well, if we're talking about multiple units, we better be thinking about sound transmission because what's your neighbor like? What kind of uh, music do they like? Heavy metal, Duh. do they have... Uh, high-heeled stiletto heels and they um, do um, some uh, dancing on the ceiling, so to speak. And uh, that transmits that transmits through laminate floors on a reinforced concrete floor in a condominium building. Um, so it can transfer through on wood assemblies um, pretty easily too, if it's not designed for. So typically, you're, 
you know, in those designs, they're going to be in building code wise, they're going to be looking for STC ratings of around 50, um, which makes loud speech inaudible. Um, 25, you know, you can hear a lot, uh, a lot. So this little simple chart that I used in the book, uh, I think it gives a reasonable representation, but it does get more complex than this. Uh, everything's as good as its weakest link. And um, so, you know, even on exterior walls, great, you've done all this on your exterior wall. Well, you better consider the windows, right? Because the windows will be your weak link and you'll hear an immense amount of sound coming through the weak link, just as it is with our values. Uh, you can lose a lot of heat through um, windows that have, uh, or walls that have low R value, or our wall that has a high R value, but then you got lots of windows and they have a very low R value comparative. Um, so that all ties into the design. But STC ratings gives you a good indicator, and you can kind of see like uh, a just a regular wood uh, wood stud wall, you got an STC rating of 32 to 37. Not very good, to be honest, not very good. Um, these ones are much better. You get, in, you get into a block wall and then you're gonna be covering it with drywall on each side or something. It's gonna be higher than um, this um, 46. You're gonna be getting over 50 pretty quickly um, with this. Now, resilient channels or some sort of resilient channel, these are showing walls. I'll show you a ceiling in a minute. The idea is it isolates the, um, the exterior finish. And so that allows for it to absorb the vibration of sound so it doesn't go through the wall so readily. Uh, so they can actually be quite helpful as long as you don't start screwing them through the, the member right through to the stud because the idea is to isolate it from uh, the stud. And that can be um, quite effective way of um, adding to your uh, STC rating. And of course, um, using a um, sound attenuated bats. Uh, so sound attenuated bats, which are designed to absorb sound. You can also get um, sound ad absorbent sheets that could go uh, form a layer below the drywall that can increase the uh, STC rating. So there's a lot of specialty products out there that you can want, uh, look at in the design process. Offsetting the studs makes a significant difference um, in the um, design as well. So this is in a con one of those stacked condominium units and so they foam the ceiling for um, sound uh, and they've got resilient channels. So these resilient channels, if you look really closely, you see it's like screwed on one side, but the other side, there's no lip. So it kind of just hangs, but when you put the drywall on it, it just hangs. It's solid, it's not going anywhere, right? Because you screw the drywall through these channels, but you don't screw the drywall through the channels into the wood, just through the channels. And that sort of will absorb a lot of the sound. So it helps to drastically improve the STC ratings on the building um, that way. So you really need to look at it, but you need to look at the whole wall system. Just don't look at one component of it and think you've got a great wall. That's not necessarily true. And as I said, the weak link is usually something like the windows and doors. So if you're going to up your STC rating, like it's in this, you know, in urban settings today, things are so noisy and you really want to um, design things really that uh, you can sleep at night. In some neighborhoods, if it's not properly designed, you're gonna have a lot of trouble. And some people are more sensitive uh, than other people to noise. You have to think about that as well. And I think in an earlier uh, class, I mentioned um, this, I should have put some images of this, but I, I, I mentioned it in an earlier class lecture. Uh, the um, So I changed my windows on my house and you know, I was thinking about the energy efficiency. They were Energy Star windows. They were good windows. They were Pella windows. But as far as STC ratings, they were awful. And here I changed all these windows, and they were a good window manufacturer. I always used that manufacturer when I was a contractor. But I never realized that it would be that, because I went from an old window that was single glazed. Again, I think I used one of those as an example um, in the... Um, uh, lecture that I did on the building envelope and 
single glazed but with a storm window with a four inch separation between the storm window and the interior window. And then I put a new window which just has a thermal pane and a very narrow thermal pane in the particular model that I bought, very narrow. Some models they have wider space so that's another factor and the thickness of the glass is another factor. So there's all these factors that go into uh, making up the STC rating. And so you want to know what it is for a window if you're going to buy it uh, because you might be in for a surprise. So my thought was that it would be much more because the other windows as far as leaks and air leakage and energy efficient were atrocious but um, sound wise they were actually pretty good and I didn't really fully appreciate that until um, I put them in and I could hear the highway which was about a kilometer away a kilometer away and I could hear it as clear as day and I'm pretty good sleeper so for me I, I could have lived with it but my wife no way it was like and uh, so uh, I was kind of stuck for a little bit because the last thing I wanted to do was change the windows so I talked that's the other thing we've talked about is building relationships, getting to know people that specialize in certain things. And so I know this, I've worked with this professor, Ramani Ramakristensen from Ryerson, really, really nice guy. And talk about somebody that's dedicated to their field. I, I probably mentioned this story before, but I remember having a coffee with him at Starbucks and all of a sudden he disappeared. And I go, Where did he, where's Ramani? And next thing I see him, see his legs hanging out. He's behind the counter listening to this ice machine asking uh, the barista a whole bunch of questions. And then uh, he came and sat down. He goes, well, you know, that the decibel of uh, the sound that that ice machine was making, if she's working there so many hours a day and she works there so many years, it's going to do this much damage to her hearing. So, I, you know, he had all these questions, right? And so he's, uh, he's always on the job when it comes to that. And that's something if you're passionate about, it's, it's a good thing to have. And so I called him up and same thing. He asked me about 10 questions. So what was the existing window? Was it single glazed? How much was the space between? And he had in his head, he could work out all the, um, you know, what the STC was for that. And then he could tell me um, what I was getting with the new window. And then he also said, easy, just put a storm window on the outside of it. What would the space be? I said, it'd still be about four inches. He said, I'll give you a higher STC rating than you had before because before you only had single glaze, glaze now you got double glazed and you've got that. And the R value, I knew it would increase myself, but I didn't think, I was a little bit skeptical. So I, I tested it on um, the master bedroom window, pilot things, test it, plan, do, check, act, PDCA. Uh, and uh, huge, like you could not hear anything. And uh, you could go on the outside and yell up to the window. You wouldn't hear anything. So um, you got to think about these things. It doesn't matter how experienced you are. You still miss things. There's those unknown unknowns. And that's why my earlier slide in the previous lecture said uh, even experienced people get caught. I got caught. I get caught too. Uh, so, but I try to learn from it. And then if I learn from it, then I try to spread it. So that's kind of my model. Um, so that's kind of um, the aspect of STC ratings and um, thinking about things in those terms and multi-unit uh, construction and fire separations and the little bit of differences of things that we need to consider and put into our process of constructing multi-units. And on the horizon, CLTs, uh, lots of opportunities, uh, I think, coming in the next few years in that area. So this is Tom Stevenson wishing you a wonderful day. And um, other than doing a review lecture, this will be the last new material lecture for this course. So have a wonderful day and we'll talk to you uh, soon. Bye for now.